Captain Walker, as well as members of our team. Thank you for your great work on this budget. As I've said before, once in a generation opportunities require once in a generation investments. This budget we're presenting today meets the moment. It invests in a fast growing state so people can get the record number of better paying jobs that are being created every day. It recognizes that historic investments in education and child care are needed now to make sure we have the well-trained workforce for the jobs of today and tomorrow. It invests in our schools, our health, our safety, our transportation, our water, our state employee workforce, and our families. The major focus of my budget is strengthening education with historic investments from cradle to career. We can and should make good on the constitutional guarantee of a sound basic education to create opportunity for everybody. My budget proposes $1.5 billion more for early childhood education and child care to benefit our youngest children who need to learn, their parents who need to work, and our businesses which need to hire them. It recognizes that with 5,000 teacher vacancies across our state, we must provide educators with the pay and the respect that they so richly deserve. That's why we're proposing raising teacher and principal pay by an average of 18 percent over the next two years. That would take us from 32nd in the nation to 16th in teacher pay, while making us first in the Southeast. We're also restoring master's pay and significantly expanding the reach of teaching fellow scholarships to attract more teachers into the profession. Other important school personnel, like bus drivers and counselors, would get a 9.5% raise over the next two years, while all school employees would get a retention bonus of either $1,000 or $1,500. If you make less than $75,000, you would get $1,500. Uh, and if you make more than $75,000, you would get $1,000. We know it's not just pay that makes teaching a challenge, but also the shortage of health. Sometimes it's as simple as actually getting children to school on time. And my budget will get more qualified, licensed school bus drivers behind the wheel. It supports student mental health by hiring 1,000 more nurses, counselors, and social workers, and providing access to school psychologists. And it invests $1 billion in school construction and renovation to make sure that children are learning in 21st century classrooms. To help our teachers educate the leaders of tomorrow, we must address the challenges of today. And we all know that the heart of North Carolina's economic success is our workers. We recruited a record number of new jobs in 2022, and the people who will fill them need the training and the skills. My budget invests in on-the-job training, credentialing, internships, pre-apprenticeships to help people move directly into good-paying jobs. It supports our community colleges with higher pay and bonuses for instructors and scholarships to help keep their tuition affordable for North Carolinians. Our state employees are the engine that powers essential services for our state, and I am so thankful for their work. Agency leaders will tell you that it's been difficult to recruit and retain employees in many state government positions like nurses and correction officers and engineers. I'm proposing an 8 percent across the board pay increase for state employees over the next two years with retention bonuses of either $1,000 or $1,500 depending on salary. There are additional state employee pay increases for those in STEP plans, 
along with funds that agencies can use to increase pay and bonuses even more for hard to fill jobs. Not only is our workforce important, but getting our infrastructure updated to meet the needs of a growing economy is critical. We've already won major infrastructure funding from the federal government, and this budget sets aside required match money as we aggressively continue to compete for more clean water, economic development, electric grid improvement, transportation, and high-speed Internet infrastructure. Our amazing success in recruiting major manufacturers has left us with uh, too few megasites to market. This budget includes investments to make megasite development, to make it easier for companies to plant a flag in North Carolina, and in turn provide spinoff work for small businesses. As we recruit the larger companies, we know that our small businesses are the backbone of our economy in every community. So this budget invests funds supporting them. I'm also proposing major investments in our innovation and clean energy economies to support the good paying jobs of the future and today. While we expand our economy, we need to keep protecting our air and our water and our land to ensure healthy communities and the natural beauty of our state. Investments in land and water preservation as well as flood resiliency will protect our health, our environment, and our communities. And thriving communities need to be safe from crime. And this budget aims to reduce crime and make our state safer through better pay and bonuses for law enforcement, school safety grants, investments in reentry programs, violence intervention, a fentanyl prosecution team, and body cameras for local law enforcement agencies. To combat cybersecurity threats affecting local governments and schools and our state agencies, my budget recommends funds to protect our systems that contain vital information, including over 40 positions to bolster the state's cybersecurity and privacy capabilities. The safety of our communities goes hand in hand with the health of our people. And we can address both by tackling the mental health crisis and opioid misuse. The recent agreement to expand Medicaid and the billions in fund that, funds that will come will allow us to improve the health of North Carolinians for generations to come. My budget proposes using a portion of the $1.7 billion Medicaid expansion signing bonus to create IHOPE Fund, which stands for Improving Health Outcomes for People Everywhere. There is a mental health crisis in our country, but we can make progress here in North Carolina with the right investments. The IHOPE Fund designates $1 billion for mental health and substance abuse with funding for inpatient and community care, facilities and support for those in mental health crisis, integrating mental health and primary care practices and schools, and to address mental health in the justice system. We all have friends and colleagues and family members who are navigating mental health and substance abuse challenges, and we know they need our support. We've got to erase the stigma of these challenges, but we just can't stop there. Investing in crisis care, the right nurses, facilities, medication, therapy, will save lives, save money, and get people well. There are funds in this budget for aging in place, as well as housing for seniors, working families, veterans, and people with disabilities. This budget is comprehensive and well-planned. This is a historic moment for our state. We have an unprecedented amount of funding to invest for the next two years from state and federal funds. Yet, the revenue projections for the following years level off dramatically, showing there will likely be insufficient funds to meet the needs of our rapidly growing state. We must continue to meet those needs, balance the budget, and make sure we have significant reserves 
to handle an economic downturn. This budget does all that. It also builds in tax fairness. We want to give the income tax breaks to working families, the people who need them, not the wealthy and not the corporations. I recommend a personal income tax cut for families making less than $200,000 a year for the next four years to get them down to 3.99% by 2027. Taxpayers earning more than $200,000 would stay at the recently reduced tax rate of 4.75%. On the corporate side, our tax rate is already competitive as businesses are coming here in droves. More corporate tax breaks mostly help out the large out-of-state or multinational corporations and not our homegrown businesses. My budget leaves our corporate income tax rate at 2.5 percent, the lowest in the country among the 44 states that have a corporate tax. Giving even more tax breaks to big corporations and the wealthiest earners will stunt our growth, starve our schools, and keep our state from reaching its full potential. It is that unlimited potential that makes North Carolina first in opportunity. And that's the name of this budget. But we didn't get here by accident. It took a forward-looking vision and focused investments for us to succeed. With these historic investments now in our communities, in our people, and in our future, we can ensure that every North Carolinian has access to the exceptional opportunity to thrive. As tradition, I'm going to take a few questions here for you. Then Kristen Walker, uh, our, our Chief Budget Officer, will come forth and explain this budget in a little more detail. But I'll take questions. Yes, Colin. Uh, the uh, spending numbers that the legislature came out with was at a certain level a couple of weeks ago. How does this budget compare? And do you think they're setting the uh, limit on spending too low to fund the military? Well, we need to make historic investments right now. So this budget is definitely more than the limit that they have set. And how much more roughly? Yes, this, there is an 18 percent increase in the first year and a 3.9 percent increase for the second year. Yes. So, so first, they don't have a budget yet. But, and secondly, we've talked about a lot of the issues that are involved in this budget, particularly Medicaid expansion and what we would do with that funding. Uh, but this would be the, the first time that they've seen this comprehensive budget that we're presenting. Yes, sir. What's the justification of having 18% raises over two years for teachers, but only 8% for state employees, and 8% over two years still doesn't keep them up to the place of inflation? So there will be additional funding for many state employees. We provided 3% for each state agency to use to increase salaries over and above that across the board, particularly for the hard to fill jobs. And they can provide funding for up to 50% of the employees who are there. In addition, we've given retention bonuses to these state employees and other state employees who are in step plans on top of what we've talked about uh, would be an additional 1.5 percent increase in their pay over and above the, the amounts that we just mentioned. But look, in our education system, historically, it's been underfunded. It's one of the reasons why we have 5,000 teacher vacancies. Ours is one of the greatest in the nation. We have to invest to make sure that our education funding is, is up to par. Yes. Point out the work Jerry was saying to um, five that right, minus point five percent. You mentioned bus drivers and counselors that came up while the bond was still applied. That's right. Why, yep. why not give them the eighteen percent for those vacancy rate jobs? Well, where our problems lie right now is make sure we have enough quality teachers in the print in the classroom. I think we've We've all come to the conclusion, uh, you know, we, we all have disagreements about what 
we need to do for education. But the thing we all seem to agree on, that public education will improve significantly in North Carolina if we have a good teacher in every classroom and a good principal in every school. And that's what this budget aims at. Uh, and, and also, I think we know the support staff is going to be important. So this provides more funding to, to try to make sure we get more bus drivers and counselors and nurses and all that support staff that teachers need. Michael. You know, I think it's important that we concentrate our tax cuts for the working families. And we also want to maintain the funding that we need to make the education, uh, the investments in education that we need as well. That's all the time we got. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I had a question on Western North Carolina and Canton. I'm sorry. I had a question on Western North Carolina and Canton. I'm deeply concerned about the people in Canton. You will see a fund in this budget. Uh, for people in Canton. We put an initial $5 million in there, but we've also uh, uh, structured it so that it can accept federal funds, uh, private funds, additional funds that the legislature might put in place. And uh, we, are, we are talking with the people there and working in a coordinated effort. I talked to the Congressman Edwards the other day. I've spoken with the mayor in Canton. We understand that this is a big blow to the people in Western North Carolina across the board, and we got to work to fix it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here today. My name is Kristen Walker. I'm the State Budget Director. I also want to uh, be sure to thank the Governor and his team as well as uh, my staff in the Office of State Budget and Management. We started working on this budget more than six months ago. And as the Governor mentioned, it's um, a comprehensive plan that takes a, a look at all of the issues facing our state. Today, um, I want to uh, give you an overview of where we are today about this historic moment in time that the governor spoke of. I want to tell you about the guiding principles that were used to develop this budget, which leads to the priority investments that we've made in this budget. As the governor said, we are at a moment in time right now of historic opportunity. We have a budget surplus that you all have heard of. There's a great potential right now with federal funds. The federal government has been investing heavily in states. Uh, there's also population growth and record job creation. Last year was a record number of jobs created in North Carolina. And with that comes a need to respond to these pressing issues facing our state and to spark opportunities for all North Carolinians. To set the stage for you with that population growth, we had the third largest population gain in the nation last year, 133,000 new North Carolinians. Almost all of those are people who moved here because they see this as a place of opportunity, because they hear about our job growth, um, because they want to move here and live here. And by 2025, just two years from now, we anticipate that we will have more than 11 million people here. As you know, we've gained almost 100,000 people each year over the last decade. The demographics of that uh, population are changing. By 2029, one in five North Carolinians will be older than 65. And not long after that, the population over 65 will exceed our population under 18. Our economy. We have the 11th largest economy in the nation. As you've heard, we have unemployment at historically low levels. We have a very tight labor market facing our employers, and we know we have folks who have not returned to the labor force. We know that labor force participation is still down. Uh, wage growth it has kept up um, and outpaced inflation, uh, not for state government workers, as we've talked about, but in other private sector areas. However, we know that right now economic growth is likely to slow 
And you see that reflected in the consensus forecast that came out last month. So that has been accounted for in this budget. So what were those guiding principles that the governor and team used to develop this budget? The first was, to, first and foremost, to maintain a fiscally sound budget. As you heard the governor say, this budget does not raise taxes. It is a balanced budget, and it keeps almost $7 billion in reserves. Uh, we also wanted to create opportunities for all North Carolinians, both education, workforce, and economic development. We want to build healthy, resilient communities, and we want to ensure that services are available for North Carolinians who are here today and those who are coming here in the future. You heard the governor speak of revenue. So what, I've, what we have here is the consensus revenue forecast. So this was agreed upon by nonpartisan staff at the General Assembly's Fiscal Research Division and nonpartisan staff at the Office of State Budget and Management. As you can see, the 33.7 billion in the first year, 33.64, so a 0.2% decrease between the two years because it accounts both for the economic conditions we're seeing as well as um, the tax cuts that were signed into law last, uh, last session. The governor, as he mentioned, has recommended policy changes promoting fat tax fairness. So personal income tax would remain for those over $200,000 per year at 4.75%. And for those incomes below $200,000 per year would um, drop down eventually to the 3.99%. The governor proposes leaving the corporate tax rate at 2.5%. And the gov governor further recommends that the sales tax transfer, the general fund sales tax transfer, that is currently at 2% to the highway fund, be maintained at the 2% level. You can see with those tax policy changes in the next line, how much additional revenue they generate for the general fund. Additionally, there's some revenue that comes from uh, PHP when you have Medicaid expansion. So that is recurring revenue. So you can see then on that bottom line the total recurring general fund revenues that, the, at, that this budget recommends. So where would those funds be invested? Uh, we always start with the base budget. So this is just last year's budget um, with non-recurring items removed. So you can see it's about $27.5 billion both years of the biennium. The governor started then with the comprehensive remedial plan. So the court has ordered that and there's funding for years two and three. We are currently in year three of that plan. So to bring that, make that plan whole, another 459 million is needed in the baseline. The governor's budget assumes that that fund, funding goes in um, before we enter year four of the plan next school year. You've heard the governor mention compensation, very large area of investment in this budget, 2.39 billion in the first year, nearly 2.8 billion in the second year. That includes both state employees and teachers. And then programmatic investments, things like K-12 enrollment, higher ed enrollment, um, further funding of K-12 education, the Medicaid rebase, uh, justice and public safety, conservation, cybersecurity, et cetera, all of those add up to $2.69 billion in the first year and $3.4 billion in the second um, to bring you to the total investments down at the bottom of a little under $33 billion in the first year and a little over $34 billion in the second. I want to stress that this budget maintains very high levels of reserve. So there's almost $6.8 billion in this budget unappropriated. So it's $4.25 billion in the savings reserve. $1 billion remains in the stabilization and inflation reserve. That's the full amount that the uh, General Assembly put in that reserve last year. More than half a billion dollars in the State Emergency Response and Disaster Relief Fund. And 700, more than $700 million in the Medicaid Contingency Reserve. And the governor has added to that reserve in this budget to bring it to that level. So to, um, moving on to opportunities and looking specifically at education. This budget ensures a sound basic education. It fully funds years two, three, four, and five of the comprehensive remedial plan. That is a total investment of almost $4.5 billion. It does all of that without raising taxes and keeping a balanced budget and keeping that funding in reserves. 
You can see the areas of the plan there. It invests in high quality teachers. It invests in the finance system, as we call it. So those are your allotments, um, disadvantaged student funding, low wealth school funding, limited English proficiency, et cetera. It provides for assistance and turnaround coaches for our public schools, and it invests heavily in early childhood learning, pre-K and early intervention. And there's also post-secondary and career alignment funding. On the next slide, you can see some of the examples. This is just illustrative of what that 4.5 billion will do, but it is, it is a um, monumental shift in education. A thousand new nurses, social workers, school counselors, school psychologists, 115 school psychologist internship positions, um, almost 1,700 new teaching fellows, uh, almost 2,700 additional teaching assistants, it provides no cost meals to almost 100,000 students. So students who are currently getting reduced lunch would receive free lunch under um, the comprehensive remedial plan. It provides early intervention services to more than 10,000 children and would expand pre-K, both increasing the rates to in, um, have more child care centers want to do in see pre-K, but also um, providing 5,000 more children with that opportunity. You heard the governor speak about teacher pay. There's 1.8 billion in this budget to recruit and retain high quality educators. This budget would bring starting teacher salary in the second year to $46,000 a year. That moves us from 46th in the nation to 16th in starting teacher pay. We are currently near the bottom in the southeast for teacher pay. We are um, second from last. It would move us second from the top for starting teacher pay. Um, it would also bring teacher pay in line with what those college graduates are seeing in other professions. As the governor mentioned, there's minimum, minimum raise each year of 10%, 6% in the second year for an average raise of 18%, restores master's pay, and it provides the $1,500 retention bonus for those making under 75K, which is most of our um, educators, as well as a $1,000 bonus for those making over 75,000. I would note that the state board voted unanimously a few weeks ago on a 10% teacher pay raise, and this um, matches that. Moving on to look at um, what the governor's budget does in the area of workforce and economic development. For workforce development, it's a multifaceted approach. So there's on-the-job training and credentialing taking place at community colleges, new investments of almost $40 million there high demand and high need workforce development, more than $230 million, that's across the UNC system, as well as the community college system, as well as independent colleges. Um, there's specific programs, they're named in your budget, a few are listed here, as well as flexible pools of funding for um, community college system, the UNC system, as well as the independents to allocate as needed in those high demand areas, be that allied health, computer science, um, construction and trade, wherever those needs are. And then there's hard to staff industry supports. So we've all heard of the difficulty um, faced with staffing skilled nursing facilities and personal care, as well as child care workers. So there's more than 215 million dedicated to um, supporting those industries and raising those pay rates. Workforce development. So as the other part of this we know, and as I mentioned before, is that um, we have a very tight labor market and we have folks who have not returned to the workforce. And one of the key reasons why that is is because they do not have adequate child care. So this, this budget uh, continues the child care stabilization grants, $500 million total over the biennium that were originally funded by the federal government. Um, there's $100 million recurring for child care subsidy rate floor within low wealth counties and $11 million for community colleges for their uh, campus child care programs, many of which were shut down during the pandemic. Um, and there's also an additional $100 million for uh, capital cost for public schools to build NC pre-K classrooms. In the area of economic development, the governor has a $325 million reserve. You can see it broken out here. Uh, mega site development, we know that we have now too few mega sites. Uh, so many uh, companies have come here, so this would help with developing additional mega sites. Um, funding for the uh, sports and entertainment fund, 
additional funding to Golden Leaf, funds to help develop Radio Island, as well as um, the other one I'll mention here is the Canton paper mill closure. So at least $5 million to Canton and the surrounding community um, earmarked in this budget for that, and as well as an additional $50 million for downtown revitalization grants. Right now, we have a historic moment of federal funding opportunities. So we had the pandemic relief funds that came to the state on sort of a formulary basis, and we didn't have to apply for them. Um, they were not, not all of them were competitive, most of them were not. But in recent years, we've had also had the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. There's hundreds of billions of dollars available from the federal government. Some of it is formulary, but much of it is competitive. Uh, we need to be positioning our state to be competitive for those funds and ensure that we bring back our share of those tax dollars to our state. The governor, in recognition of that, puts $225 million additional into the federal infrastructure match reserve. Um, we know at, le at least $115 million right now of known state match requirements for things like clean water and drinking water, energy and other programs, um, and then it's some additional funds for programmatic support. The state needs to be nimble and needs to be responsive as these federal funding opportunities are announced. Many of them are still being developed, um, so, but there's great potential here, and many states are, are looking at this, so we need to be sure we're prepared. <coughs> The next area, um, building healthy and resilient communities. This budget assumes Medicaid expansion. Uh, as you know, expanding Medicaid is a win-win for our state. It brings health care to more than 600,000 North Carolinians who desperately need it. It helps prevent rural hospitals from closing. Um, it helps fight the opioid academic, epidemic. It also brings additional funding to the state. So the $1.74 billion federal bonus, we expect a savings to the general fund of almost $56 million annually. Um, it would inject $5 billion into the economy, and we also estimate that we'd have more than a $240 million boost in state and local sales taxes. The governor recognizes the difficulties facing our state, both in health and mental health. Um, there's more than one and a half billion dollars in this budget designated towards mental health services. You heard of the uh, billion dollars earmarked from the Medicaid bonus payment to create the IHOPE fund. You can see where that would go, but it would assist with Medicaid reimbursement rates, um, community-based behavioral health treatment, uh, to assist with integrating behavioral health, also with our justice system, and help children with behavioral health needs who are involved in the child welfare system. And it, finally, there's funding for telehealth in rural communities and other technology to improve health outcomes. Additional mental health items include, um, and you heard this mentioned before, but more than 500 million for school social workers, psychologists, nurses, and counselors. Funding for the 988 line and the NC Psychiatric Access line. Um, funding for evidence-based behavioral health supports in schools as well as additional support for crisis units in ju for justice-involved youth. There's also funding aimed at uh, universities and higher ed, including the 24-7 mental health hotline and mental health first aid, as well as flexible funding for the university system to address mental health um, emergencies taking place there. Additional uh, large health investments include more than $160 million for community-based services for people with disabilities. That's innovation waiver rates, innovation slots, and transitions to community living. There are statewide health investments. So there's funding set aside from the Medicaid bonus payment for rural, for rural health, uh, excuse me, rural hospital rescue fund. There's support for all the county social service offices as they wind down the public health emergency and they have to deal with um, t um, removing those folks from Medicaid and, and assisting those folks. And there's support for older North Carolinians to stay in their homes with needed uh, home repairs. And the final area that I'll talk with you about today is ensuring services for North Carolinians. Uh, this is the largest investment in the state workforce in more than 50 years. Um, 
the governor's budget proposes a 5% cost of living increase in year one with a 3% in year two. The bonus is $1,500 for those who make less than $75,000 a year, $1,000 for those who make more than $75,000 a year. That would be paid in two, two installments, so it would function as a retention bonus with one payment in November and the other in April. Um, employees who are on step plans would see an, receive an additional 1.5%, so that's law enforcement as well as correctional officers. And as was mentioned, there's what we're calling an enhanced labor market adjustment reserve, which provides all state agencies with 3% of their total general fund payroll um, to allocate to their hard to staff and hard to need, um, hard to fill positions. One, one item of note here is that this is not just on general fund employees. The governor has also provided uh, sufficient funding to do it for receipt supported employees. So you heard last year many agencies talking about how they were unable to give um, additional raises to those who are either operate off of receipts that come in from fees or receipts that come off of federal funds because often they don't they're not able to increase the amount of receipts. So this would actually um, cover the receipts uh, from the general fund. Retirees would see a 2% recurring COLA with a 2% supplement additional in year one and a 1% supplement year two. And it um, fully funds the state health plan as well as the retirement system, ADEC. Additionally, beyond pay, the governor wanted to look at employee benefits. So he proposes two changes to annual leave. He increases um, it, the annual leave rates, which you can see there, so that folks get more days earlier in their career. We know that the turnover rate is more than double for employees in their first year of service. Um, he also recommends transitioning longevity pay, which has been around for almost 60 years in state government, to retention pay. So right now, if you're a state employee, once you've been here 10 years, um, you're rewarded with a 1.5% payment the anniversary of your, uh, in the month of the anniversary of your employment. The governor proposes moving that sooner in, in one's career so that they start to receive a 1% payment at two years and then it increases from there. It does not increase the maximum amount in both of these categories. Um, maintains the same amount of vacation days at the highest level as well as the retention pay. Why such a historic investment? I'll just remind you of some of the challenges facing state government. Um, turnover rate of almost 17 percent, first year employees at more than 36 percent, an average vacancy rate right now of 23 percent, which is almost double what it was before the pandemic. Um, the average state employee salary has increased only 20 percent since 2010, but CPI is, is up almost 38 percent. A nationwide survey indicated that 52 percent of state and local government employees are considering leaving their jobs. So this is a, a moment in time that we have to respond to. So to conclude, you know, this budget invests in historic opportunities. It is balanced, it does not raise taxes, and it maintains nearly $7 billion in unappropriated reserves. So with that, um, thank you all, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Uh, with regard to the $5 million to the Stanton Mill closure, if I am a mill worker and I am unemployed, how I how I go about trying to access any of that? And could you also explain uh, what people should do between the time they might be let go and this budget takes effect? Sure. So that funding right now is still being developed. Obviously, that was a. a um, very unfortunate recent event as we developed this budget. So our Department of Commerce and others will be working with the community to figure out what is the best way to do that. One, um, because as I said, this is a comprehensive plan, so one item that I don't have a slide in here for is the governor's proposed changes to unemployment insurance benefits. So he has um, increased, his budget proposes increasing the amount of unemployment ben weekly benefit you can get as well as um, ex uh, increasing um, 
the uh, levels at which you would receive that funding. So it would remain tied to the unemployment rate, but you wouldn't have to have as high an unemployment rate to reach those, those peak levels in duration a week. So we can get you more information on that. But in response to the fact that if we enter an economic downturn, um, more folks will be looking for UI benefits. And I would just note the UI trust fund, which is held by Washington and which we cannot do anything with, has almost $4 billion in it. So we are more than prepared um, if that unfortunately occurred. Yes, Don. Can you clarify if the, the, the bonuses are those the secret and Yes. Yes. All employees, regardless of funding source, regardless of teacher or state employee, would receive those bonuses. It is 75 paid of break and 1,600 also for pay. Yes. And the, um, the school nurture, you said 1,000. How is that divided? Where, where are those going? Are, is it just nurses or nurses and social It's nurses, social workers, school psychologists, and social workers. So, and it would. It would guarantee um, those in all tier one and tier two counties and those who do not have one. Um, and then it further funds the, that goes out in an allotment. So there would be additional beyond that as well. Yes. As far as the state employee wages go, um, does the budget specifically earmark higher wages for any specific harder to fill positions? Or is that all left to the discretion of the agency to decide how to do so? That's correct. It's left to the discretion of the agency heads who, who know the challenges they're facing um, better than anyone. Yes. Can I ask you about personal care services rates? Uh, what will Delta Mississippi provide? What will the rates increase to? That is a very good question. I don't think I have it in my notes, but. Yes, so um, the mega sites, there was a report on mega sites, or there is a report in the works on where those could potentially be located, but that funding would go to our Department of Commerce to work on in conjunction with EDP and C to determine the best locations and, and where to develop those. So, TBD. Yes. So, I'm trying to understand the structure of the manager investments. Yes. It looks like you have this um, baseline education investment that funds year three and brings us up to where we should be. Yes. And then Yes. Yep. You've got it exactly right. And it's found in three different places. It's found in the Department of Public Instruction, Department of Health and Human Services, as well as at the UNC system. Thank you. Yes. Lisa. Putting in this fifty million in the rural hospital rescue fund. How is that going to be distributed? Is that going to be hospitals are going to be applying for it if they're at risk, or just is this going to be competitive grants? How's that going to work? So that funding would go to the Department of Health and Human Services to determine the best way to distribute that funding. And that's the same thing for child care stabilization then? Is that really just go to the NCDB and they'll be saying? So they've been, there was over $800 million from the federal government for child care stabilization grants and they've, ex, they've expended, I want to say, $600 million of that. So it would continue in that same um, method that they've been using to distribute the federal funding. So the money in the budget this year for the child care stabilization grants actually comes from the savings reserve. So the governor takes out $500 million from the savings reserve, um, which as I mentioned is already overfunded based on our, um, his, our calculation set in statute. So it maintains the savings reserve at a level higher than what is needed, um, but takes $500 million and invests it back in people and child care. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, so the governor's budget looks specifically at getting the starting teacher salary up to $46,000 and also looks to eliminate some of the plateaus that exist under the current teacher salary schedule. So um, all of the steps receive an increase of at least 10% in the first year and at least 6% in the second year, um, and it brings us up to that $46,000 um, teacher beginning teacher salary mark. No, and we have we can share with you the 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 pay plan the steps, and I think it's actually in the front of the book. Follow Gary, on this question. Um, does the budget contain the licensing pilot that the Board of Education is talking about? Yes, it does. I think that's in the. Um, well, not no, not exactly specifically. I'd have to. Let me get back to you on that one. Let me pull it up and look. So going back to that uh, calculation of cut down the savings you said, so you've got 200,000 for the private care savings that you have. Where else does that money go? Where can we get 300,000? 300 million in the second year of the biennium for the child care stabilization grants. Yes. Yep. Travis. The governor said 1.5 That's correct. Okay. That's and correct. A separate figure. And then the five hundred million child care stabilization grant, is that over two years? It's yes, yeah, so it's two hundred million in the first year and three hundred million in the second. Okay. Why two hundred and second as opposed to the first? And, and, and I mean, does that go away if the federal government and Congress agree to more more grants? Uh, we that would be a wonderful problem to have if Congress <laughs> approved more grants. It's more in the first year because we have not spent all of the eight hundred million um, that we got during um, the, from the pandemic. So of the 800 million, we still have some of that funding available. Okay. Um, and if you don't mind, is, is there anything, so the governor very briefly mentioned housing in the past here for the program to help veteran teachers. I guess maybe first responders can't remember, buy a house with a, a fund where basically the government, I think, is helping pay down payments. Um, maybe I'm misremembering. Is that in here? Is there anything for housing? There is $160 million for housing. There is not the down payment assistance funding. Um, if you, it's in the Housing Finance Agency, and I'm trying to find the page for you. So on page 93, you can see where the governor would invest that $160 million for housing. So $50 million to the Housing Trust Fund. Um, as well as 50 million specifically for workforce housing supports. So that gets at folks earning between 60 and 120 percent of area media, median income. Uh, additional funding to the workforce housing loan program, and then 25 million specifically for senior affordable housing. believe it's in the front. Yes. It's page 11. Yes, so the most recent cost estimates we have for the African American Monument is $3 million, and that's what's funded in the budget. And you can see, we did not talk about very much about the capital investments, but you can see those in the book. Um, continues many projects that the General Assembly, or all the projects that the General Assembly already started in the last budget, and then um, funds some, some new needs within state government and at the UNC system. When the governor said we're building 32 to 16 in the country, is that one of the rankings that it only includes state funding or it's also inclusive of the federal it, it, It's inclusive of all funds. Okay. Uh, let me get back to you on that. I, I know I have it in a footnote. And then 
Maybe if I could just make sure I'm reading the salary schedule on page 11. Yes. <laughs> Before I leave this person. Uh, a, a, a first year teacher would go from making 37,000 to, wait a minute. Okay, so the 46 is not until the second year when you're talking That's about correct. making that a minimum. A, a first year teacher in state funding would get uh, $3,000 or $4,000 more in the first year under this budget as opposed to we just kept the budget. And if I go down to 18, it's a difference between $200. I mean, I'm reading this right. I'm, I'm describing it correctly. Is all I'm saying. Uh, so if I yes. Three, if you four, didn't, four, so if you didn't do anything with teacher salaries at all, you would just stay with that first column. So, you know, it's first year teacher next year. If you do nothing, would get.